Hello. Can, can I, can I um, welcome you um, to this uh, lecture? We are delighted to welcome Professor Meryl Silverstein, who is one of this year's Oxford Martin Fellows. Um, Professor Silverstein um, is um, currently at the University of Syracuse uh, in the Department of Sociology, where he has the Marjorie Cantor Endowed Professorship in Aging Studies. Uh, and those of you who uh, know Professor Silverstein know that he has a long uh, experience of working in the field of aging, particularly around issues to do with intergenerational relationships and the family. Before this, he worked uh, at um, UCL, uh, and he is a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America uh, and of the Brookdale National Fellowship Program and also of the Fulbright International Senior Scholars Program. Um, we've been delighted to have Merrill with us uh, this term. His attachment via the school was to the Institute of Population Aging. Um, and we are uh, equally delighted that he agreed to give this lecture on adult children providing support to their aging parents and I believe this is going to come out of the longitudinal study that you have been involved with, um, looking at the generations. Uh, and Merrill has said that um, he will talk for about 45 minutes. Um, we will have about 15 minutes at the end for questions, but that he's also very happy to take questions of clarification uh, during the lecture. So can we welcome Professor Silverstein? Thank you for that introduction. Um, very pleased uh, to be here as a Martin Fellow and uh, to be associated with the uh, Aging um, Institute here. Um, it's been uh, really fun uh, to interact with everybody and uh, learn new things as I've uh, gone along. Uh, I'm going to talk um, 45 minutes or so um, about this topic, and I can, um, I'm going to look up occasionally because it's better for me to see the slides up there. Uh, aging, <clears throat> aging parents are receiving support uh, from their adult children, which um, at first uh, glance should, see, um, should seem very obvious. Uh, uh, why do they do it? Well, uh, there are many reasons, but do they do it? Of course they do, and some of the um, uh, scholarly literature has uh, tried to untangle uh, why and when adult children uh, come forth uh, to support their older parents in need. Uh, the outline I'll work with today um, is to um, establish uh, that care and support for aging parents um, has become a normative life stage, that is an expected uh, phase of life, uh, whereby uh, children um, almost expect to have at least one parent surviving uh, into uh, their 80s. Then I'll talk a bit about um, what I'm calling micro uh, models, some of which come out of sociology, some out of economics, uh, to examine the um, intergenerational dynamics over the life course um, by which um, uh, children come to support their parents. Um, I'll then move to um, an empirical examination uh, of reciprocity over the life course, that is investments in children and how they pay off later on. Um, then the more uh, speculative part of the talk will be in the final three, uh, to widen the lens a bit to incorporate um, state, welfare state uh, policies as well as norms and values, and try to integrate uh, those two in terms of welfare uh, state and family balance. And then uh, talk a little bit about a concept that um, I borrowed from another field and, and, and am applying with some tweaks here, uh, the idea of moral capital um, that might integrate a lot of what the literature is talking about in this area. So it's a, it's a, it's a broad sweep, um, but I'll start more narrow and then broaden as we go along. Um, Many of you are familiar with the aging of populations, so I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, except in this slide to show you this is the uh, breakdown of the older population in the United States, 65 and over. And what you can see is that there'll be a disproportionate increase in the 75 plus um, group, um, as well as the 85 plus group. Now, when we think about um, care, uh, both formal and informal care, um, it's, of course, disproportionately going to the 75 and older group. 65-year-olds uh, are as close to 45-year-olds um, 
uh, that as 45-year-olds are to 35 and 25-year-olds in some sense. So the real gap, the, the surge in the increase in need, which will uh, have to be um, borne by both welfare state and family will come in the post-75 and certainly the post-85 group, which is experiencing the greatest increase. So what is caregiving? Um, and I'd also add support here. Um, it's um, variously defined, but it's a uh, uh, general uh, description would be help and support provided to chronically impaired individuals, um, usually defined as somebody having a limitation in an activity of daily living. These usually can be um, uh, of two types, one instrumental, which I list here, IADL, that is preparing meals, doing laundry, running errands, doing housework, and uh, the more personal um, uh, tasks, uh, which we call ADL, bathing, dressing, and feeding. And um, both of these needs um, are met often by informal sources, um, uh, first spouse if available, and then children, and often um, both. Uh, estimates are a little hard to come by in this area, but uh, most uh, settle uh, on somewhere between uh, 35 and 45 percent. One study showed 43 percent of those 85 and over who are still living in the community get at least some form of informal care. Um, caregiving, um, I'm not the first to, um, to suggest this. Uh, this is at least 30 years old, has been suggested as a career. That is, when, when the caregiver <coughs> excuse me, enters the role, um, uh, they, they uh, occupy it for uh, often a um, lengthy amount of time, and their investment in the role <coughs> is quite substantial. The typical caregiver in the U.S. is a 46-year-old woman who also works outside the home and spends more than 20 hours a week providing unpaid care for a mother who's more likely to survive. And given the increased longevity, um, the majority of the older uh, population will probably um, expect to receive care from family members, and uh, children also will be more likely to provide some care to an older adult. These, again, these, these life course models, I, uh, after exhaustively searching the literature, it's hard to come up with an actual percentage, but most say a majority of adult children will provide care to another adult, and often parents at some time in their lives. About half of caregivers at any one point in time are adult children, which is why children uh, and intergenerational relations um, becomes a salient topic in trying to understand this. This gives you an idea of the number of hours devoted to caregiving from uh, California study, um, which um, uh, shows that um, number of hours actually goes up with the age of the caregiver, which of course is correlated with the age of the, the recipient. But you can see these are not trivial amounts of care um, hours per week. <clears throat> so why do uh, adult children provide support uh, to their parents? Um, I'm not going to talk about bioevolutionary approaches, um, but there are some um, that um, give some credence to uh, gene survival as a uh, underlying reason. This is um, most often discussed in terms of the grandmother effect, that is, altruistic grandmothers who care uh, for their uh, grandchildren enhance their survival and hence the survival of those altruistic genes that, that uh, go forward uh, in time. Um, there are also um, theories about uh, self-interested behavior, that is, if you give to your parents, you're more likely um, to get that bequest you're more likely to get a transfer of land ownership, and you're more likely, perhaps, to get um, care uh, for your children from that grandparent. So there's a self-interested reward mechanism in this. And, and I think this perspective, although I call it genetic, really dominates in the economics literature and the microeconomics of the family. But most explanations in the literature focus on social mechanisms, which is what I'll talk about. <clears throat> so the um, orientations toward intergenerational care uh, break down um, roughly into sociology and economics, but there's overlap in cross-fertilization across. Um, the first um, is, are, are those that emphasize uh, norms, values, uh, affection, closeness, bonding, attachment, and social integration across the generations. That we, we do it because we love our parents, essentially. Uh, at least that's the dominant explanation. Um, there are other, uh, another camp emphasizes transactions between family members, usually 
in the form of time or labor and money transfers up and down the generations. That is, we care for our parents because uh, they've given us something perhaps in the past that we want to repay. Uh, this is summarized in the uh, rotten child effect of Gary Becker, that even a rotten child will support his or her uh, parent for various self-interested reasons. The normative uh, affective models um, uh, come out of a long line of thinking about how families and formal institutions, uh, mostly government uh, but also the private sector, um, operate in two different, different spheres in, in modern societies. Uh, Gene Litwack and Marvin Sussman have read, wrote a lot about this in the 70s and 80s, uh, talking about how families can rely on um, effectual bonds, uh, develop effectual bonds while leaving instrumental care more to the formal sectors of society. So there's been a split between those two functions. Um, a longstanding uh, guru in gerontology, Rosenmayer, talked about intimacy at a distance, that even in spite of our geographically mobile society, families uh, still do have emotional connections to each other and therefore can respond when the need arises. This became formalized in um, the intergenerational solidarity uh, paradigm of uh, Vern Bankson and colleagues, where um, I call it a periodic table of the ways that families are connected, family members are connected to each other. And it itemized the sentiments, the behaviors, uh, the values, the attitudes, and geographic arrangements um, that uh, bind generations together. But the principal binding agent was um, I guess the sentimental part, the emotional closeness, what uh, Bengtson called effectual solidarity. And so th these, these models um, really come out of a, a more of a social psychological orientation, you might say, but have been really dominated, have really dominated the literature and the sociology of, of the aging family. Then we have the transactional models. Um, everyone I cite here is an economist. Um, and the idea here is that parents um, want to reduce the uncertainty uh, of their old age support by investing in children who um, may serve um, unmet need should that arise. And yeah. Gary Becker's treatise um, uh, has, has a lot of these elements in it. However, um, altruism, which is um, a bit of a um, straw man for uh, economists, um, has shown various results, but I guess the um, most rigorous test by Altanji showed that pure altruism um, is a fiction, um, at least in the United States, but Cox and colleagues found altruism works more in um, developing countries. And I, I guess um, it makes some sense. In the developed world, um, would you give money, and this isn't usually cast as money, would you give money to the most needy child or the most um, able child? And um, in the US, we might, um, and this is true, I think, in, in uh, Europe as well, uh, it's the needy child that gets the money, but that goes against your self-interest if you want to have the, the, the most adept child um, prosper and then give back to you, you would give to the um, child with the, with the best endowments, and that seems to be true in developing countries. There are also uh, power dynamics at work and a famous article by Bernheim et al. Uh, they showed that the promise of a bequest, an inheritance, incentivizes adult children uh, to provide uh, care for their aging parents with the idea that there's a threat of withholding that bequest. And again, this uh, mechanism has been shown uh, to be true in some contexts and not in others, so I can't say that this is a um, universal uh, law, but it, it's received a lot of attention. And then the Cox um, and his camp have examined um, the risk of non-compliant children. That is, if you invest in your children but they don't come forth, with any attention to you, without any support for you. Um, uh, the best thing you could do, or could have done, is to train them, instill in them values that will incentivize them to return the investment that's given in them. And uh, Cox has done a bit of this in terms of what, we, what he called moral training um, of children. So here we have, um, I, I guess, a hybrid model of investment, but also um, values that are also then uh, come into play. A lot of uh, the economics literature, um, and this is true across a lot of categories of their work, um, uh, but also in sociology, uh, deal with the idea of social capital. And there was a lot of definitions of social capital. 
um, but um, it's often, uh, maybe the common denominator is that uh, uh, social capital is rooted either in relationships and networks and, as well as in communities. And it's built through investment, and the investment could be in terms of time, it could be in terms of emotion, it could be in terms of material resources um, or money uh, that build in others the obligation to reciprocate. So this sounds very familiar with the, very close to the life course model that I'm talking about from the economic sphere that you invest in order um, to receive um, later on. But the enforcement mechanism of that is, is a bit uncertain. And part of this has to do with the fact that the uh, applying market principles to intergenerational relations only goes so far. Um, often the payback is decades in the future. So how do you enforce the payback if it's so far advanced, and in most countries, there are no legal remedies um, in order to get that support should you need it. And in the developed world, most of it will be in terms of time rather than money, but also sometimes in terms of money. Um, the models that um, I've worked mostly with um, come from the life course perspective, uh, which is an overarching um, paradigm which um, in, in part says that uh, what happens earlier in your life has consequences for what comes later. Um, and so what uh, we've proposed in, in some of our work is that um, early in the life course, uh, parents uh, nurture, support, give to their children in various ways um, in order to later get back from them. So we think about support as a two-way street. Um, it's reciprocal, but again, the recipro reciprocity is lagged often over many decades, so it's not completely enforceable and operates under principles that lie somewhat outside of the market um, principles of exchange uh, that you might see in economics. Uh, people often say, well, what is it that enforces this? And it's almost universal that people talk about guilt. Now, guilt, um, you're only going to feel guilty if you're behaving in a way that's not consistent with your values, and those values also come from your parents. So in some ways, you're learning how to um, repay your parents um, in a way that's self-enforcing uh, through the mechanism of guilt. And I can tell you when um, my daughter was very young, um, I would bring her to see my parents in California, and um, I would make sure she was aware that we were visiting my parents because it's a good thing to visit older people and take care of them, right, and make them feel good. Now, was I doing that to <laughs> satisfy <laughs> or instill in her those values so that I would eventually benefit? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't conscious, but I think it's there. And this is something that we see uh, coming up in the literature. I'm going to show you an empirical test of this in a minute. Um, in previous work, we've uh, shown that um, um, adolescent children, these are, would be children uh, 15, 16, 17, who had more shared activities with their parents in um, uh, 1970, um, uh, provided more support uh, to those parents 30 years later. And those activities were mostly a social leisure activity. So it was really an investment in t of time in those children. And there was a large literature of families who have dinner together, seem to function better. And, and in some ways, this is showing that because one of our items was you have dinner. How often do you have dinner together as a family? And we were able to show that the higher the score on, in this kind of affiliation, the um, more likely um, support would be given to the parents, turning the clock ahead by 30 years. So the interest in, in the empirical test I'll show you is on adult intergenerational exchanges when the children are now in their 30s, because the investment in 30-year-olds would be quite different from an investment in, in an adolescent. So we examined how parental investments in young adult children predict future provision of care and support by these now middle-aged children. Um, I'm going to talk about three mechanisms that come out of the exchange or reciprocity literature, if you will. Um, the first um, is modeling of the desired behavior. That's me taking my daughter to my parents. I'm modeling or demonstrating to her what I want her to do uh, for me. Uh, the second is uh, what Tony Antonucci called the support bank. That is, parents invest materially in their children as kind of a prepayment for later support. This is, uh, has to be enforced by some kind of norm of reciprocity that is an obligation on the part of children to give back. 
And then the third is what I spoke about earlier, the bequest motive. That is, parents might leverage the bequest uh, in order to um, uh, induce support from children. So we call this a post-payment, promise of a post-payment for their support. So the data set I'm going to um, rely on is the longitudinal study of generations. It's a multi-generational, multi-time point study started in 1971 by Vern Bengtson with repeated panels up to 2005. And here you see the schematic of the, of the waves of measurement up to 2005. And we just got a grant to continue it in 2016. So we will have data on the same individuals and the same families um, uh, this year. Um, the sample consists of about 3,500 people in total from um, about, uh, well, this 374 families. It's, it's more like 400 uh, recruited within the Southern California region. Uh, the focus of what I'll talk about here is the middle generation. Uh, the, think of them as the baby boomers who were 1985. I'm going to jump there where I circled the two um, measurement points. We're 33 years old and uh, 53 years old in 2005, and each of these kids have a surviving mother as of 2005. So I'm not going to talk about fathers. Uh, we can talk about that after. Um, and in fact, we want to bring them in, but there are more, of course, more mothers surviving into their 70s and 80s. And so um, this analysis is restricted to them. Um, so the measures of the three mechanisms I'll, show, I'll share quickly with you. First, we have modeling um, of behavior. And in 1985, and I should say we're, we're using data from both uh, the mother um, and the child. So the mother's data comes from 1985, and the child's data comes from 2005. So in 1985, the mother was asked, have you ever been a caregiver to an older relative between 1971 and 1985? And that's a long stretch of time, of course. Um, and uh, the answer is just yes and no. So it's a crude instrument, but nevertheless, um, represents what we want. Then the two other uh, dimensions, which um, I'm labeling here life cycle reciprocity, is when whether parents invested in that child. And again, this is um, uh, from the adult child's point of view, um, uh, where the previous one was the mother's point of view, um, asked whether they received the following from their parents in 1985 when they were in their 30s large gifts, cash, stocks, bonds, major items. And we did some, um, we had some questions about the value of the, those transfers as well, which I, I won't talk about. And then the anticipation of a bequest is uh, asked of the children, so it's their awareness of whether they're getting anything from their parents upon their demise. And that was asked whether you expect to receive an inheritance from your parents. And again, we asked what value would that be, but I, I imagine uh, at least half, if my memory is correct, um, did not, preferred not to give us a dollar amount. Uh, so we have the yes, no, whether they expect. In terms of outcome, we're interested in whether the kid, the child, provides support to his or her mother um, in 2005. And uh, we break it down into three, uh, two components. One is uh, instrumental support, whether they provide help with chores, transportation, shopping, help when sick. And a second dimension um, is the um, more emotional side of, of the bonding in the family. Uh, do they provide information and advice, emotional support, and do they discuss important life decisions um, with their mother? Each of these is rated on an eight-point scale, so I won't bore you with the details, but these two um, dimensions come out as um, analytically separate, so we treat them as, as separate uh, constructs. So this is the general model. I hope you can see it's a little small, but the rows are not deep here, so I think you can see it. Um, this is the life cycle model. So the, the, the three boxes on the left refer to the three mechanism I spoke about. Um, that is the mother provided support um, to older relatives. That's modeling. The child received financial support of goods or, or money or goods in 1985. And that the uh, child expects to get an inheritance. And then we look at the relationship between that and the right hand side here, which um, would be instrumental support and socio-emotional support. Now you'll notice that proximity and frequency of face-to-face -face contact are, are both in the model, because it's theoretically possible that these investments cause children to interact more with their parents, live closer to their parents, and that is what's enhancing the support prov provision. 
And in fact, those two black lines you see are the statistically significant paths in this sort of null model. So we know that if you live closer to your mother, you'll provide more hands-on support. If you have more contact with your mother, you'll have more social and emotional, um, uh, a stronger social emotional relationship with her. And that seems fairly consistent with what we might expect with, respect, you know, with, with regard to uh, uh, contact and, and proximity. Then we control for other things here, which um, have to do with norms and, and um, emotional bonding, as well as some demographic characteristics, gender, education, income, whether the mother's widowed, and so on, and, their, and her health. So we cover a fair amount of ground in our control variables. I'm not going to talk a lot about those, um, but we're really interested in the left-hand um, boxes and how those work. So I'm going to show you one by one in the multivariate model how that would work. Uh, the first is um, child's expectation for an inheritance. Well, if a child had a stronger expectation for an inheritance in 1985, he or she will have more contact with the parent, with the mother, in 2005. And if we accept this as an indirect effect, we can also say that that then leads to more support to the mother. What about whether the child received an investment uh, of um, uh, goods or services or money? Um, here we see children who receive large gifts from their parents in 1985, both lived closer and had more contact with their parents in, 19, in 2005. And those two, of course, increased both uh, instrumental and social emotional support. So these two don't show any direct impact on support. It's mediated by arrangements, geographic arrangements, and, um, and an interaction that um, uh, evolves from, from these early uh, conditions. Um, in terms of demonstration, whether the mother provided support to her older relatives, mostly her parents, um, between 71 and 85, we see uh, direct effects to both. It's not mediated by distance, proximity. It's not mediated by amount of contact. So there seems to be a um, continuity within families. Whether you want to call this modeling or just intergenerational continuity of some sort or even a genetic factor. Uh, the children are mimicking, reproducing what the mother did for the grandmother and the, probably the grandfather uh, many years earlier. Um, economists would probably call this demonstration modeling. A sociologist might call this cultural continuity. But it um, does seem to progress in a similar way through families. Okay, so what we see is the direct effect of modeling. This is a summary of what I just said. Um, evidence of prepayment and postpayment um, works through enhancing opportunities for exchange through uh, greater contact and uh, closer um, distance, greater pro proximity. Um, I, I think this um, added to other work we've done seemed to support that intergenerational care and support um, is reciprocal um, over the life course of, of families and that there are mixed motivations on the part of children, even just looking at these exchange dynamics. Um, that is, um, reciprocating for investments um, seems to be the dynamic by which um, older parents get uh, support, um, but also uh, that the children are absorbing some sort of culture of care by either observing their mother providing support, learning from that, or, or uh, some uh, other condition within the family uh, that allows this continuity uh, to occur. Now, uh, families, um, as I've discovered, um, having done this work, and, and more so with my um, uh, predecessor, Vern Bankson, who started this study in the late 60s, when families were fairly homogeneous and uh, cookie cutter, you know, they, the families became much more complicated over the 30 or 40 years of this study. Um, not only do we see later fertility, uh, we see no fertility. Um, many of the grandchildren of our middle-aged generation uh, remain unmarried in their 30s and 40s and without children. So what you can see that uh, the dynamics of intergenerational exchange could be very different depending on when you have children and if, of course, if you have children. Um, some of the main um, uh, factors that we think uh, at work that we're starting to study are um, smaller families, um, delayed fertility, uh, and people with no families. How do the childless cope with uh, the need for care and support? Uh, what about divorce and remarriage? And 
divorce and remarriage, and divorce and remarriage, right, in the same family where we have uh, stepchildren in various um, uh, combinations related to each other, um, uh, and how do uh, parents then uh, draw on support from children that um, some of whom are biological, some of whom are step, uh, and th these are really unknown um, factors at this point, although it does, research seems to suggest that uh, those ties are weaker. And it's even weaker um, in the presence of, a, for a biological child, in the presence of a stepchild. Um, economic stagnation for young adults in many countries um, has become a reality, uh, forcing them to uh, live at home. We know the Great Recession has stimulated greater co-residence among young adults um, uh, across almost all the countries that have experienced it. Uh, and retirement insecurity for older adults. Um, those who lost money um, in the great upheaval of uh, 2007, 2008, um, are um, experiencing maybe uh, the lack of resources and maybe greater need to rely on children. And then we have the overall retrenchment of the welfare state that seems to be occurring with various speeds in various countries in Europe, um, but I would also maintain in the US, uh, certainly since the 19. 80s and what that means uh, for families who have to now maybe rely on each other uh, to a greater extent. All of these, I think, <clears throat> feed into intergenerational exchanges and the extent to which we think we can rely on children or provide for those children. <clears throat> so um, in terms of um, putting this, and I'm going to widen the lens a bit for the next um, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, to talk about um, something, what I've talked about mostly here are micro-family dynamics. Um, but of course, families are embedded in larger social structures. And um, this figure shows you the person-family behavior at the core, which is mostly what I've talked about with some um, relevance to cultural and social capital. Um, but I want to shift a little bit to institutional capital um, after I talk a bit about cultural capital. Uh, so I'm going to use the word capital in a, in a Bourdieuian sense, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a, in a minute. Um, so cultural capital um, seems to be very important if one is thinking about trying to um, uh, enforce uh, children to provide support to you if you've helped them out early in their lives. That is, children who renege on this kind of informal contract that you've invested in them and they should provide uh, for you, again, as I mentioned, relies on an internalization of norms. Those norms could come from family members or parents, but could also come from the, the wider culture. Uh, I call it culture of care. I'll talk about a kind of an extreme version of that um, in a second. So cultural capital, in a way, is the kind of implicit understanding that children are responsible for X, Y, and Z, and that's going to vary across cultures as well as across countries. Your investment, your social capital in your children will be enhanced if cultural capital is also high. And so I think it's important to understand what are the cultural scripts of the culture and the country that we're, we're examining. And what economists call moral hazard, that is not getting back what you think you will, um, can be minimized, I say avoided here, but really can only be minimized by transmitting those norms to children and allowing them to, um, exposing them to the wider norms of the culture should the culture um, uh, value intergenerational uh, support. When I said about an extreme version, I think we can use this as an example, filial piety in Asian countries. That's Confucius who um, uh, wrote um, extensively about this, and I'm quoting um, Professor uh, Sung from uh, Korea who talks about filial piety consisting of the practice of filial respect and care to parents, which is a normative duty and obligation of adult children. So this, I think, is a very strong piece of what I call cultural capital. In China, in particular, parents, I'm, I'm saying universally, almost universally, expect to get something back from their children. And in fact, there are laws in place that guarantee this um, for them. It provides a whole list of rules about conduct, about service, and spiritual devotion to parents. It's very extreme, and not everyone, of course, can live up to it. Maybe nobody can live up to it. Um, but it's part of the cultural fabric of the society that gives, I think, a cultural benefit um, to older people. Um, and um, in the Judeo-Christian um, tradition, um, there's actually only two places in the um, 
Hebrew Bible where the Old Testament where um, uh, parents are mentioned. And of course, the, the um, Ten Commandments on her, thy mother and thy father. Um, and it's also found in Leviticus um, where uh, it tells us that we should each revere your mother and father. And interestingly enough, as I search through Talmudic interpretations of what this means, um, revere is interpreted as respect and honor as care. Right? So I'm going to go back. Respect and care. So this seems to be fairly universal, right? To respect and care. So respect's about attitude and care's about behavior. Now, I would say that in, in Asian countries, the, uh, uh, the, the, this, this cultural mechanism is stronger than it would be in the West, but it's still there. So I think that this sort of what I'm going to be calling moral capital is still um, part of both societies. Uh, cultural capital, um, I think I've explained mostly what it is. It's really about normative um, obligations based on shared cultural beliefs about what's desirable and proper. Um, we see this, of course, in the United States in um, immigrant groups and their descendants. Um, here, um, I'll just show you something with respect to Asian and uh, Hispanic families in the U.S. And this is uh, the primary source of personal assistance uh, among those with need um, by race and ethnicity. Uh, PCA is personal care assistance. So you can see um, that among Hispanics and Asians, um, these are all 65 and older. Um, family personal care um, exceeds that of uh, non-family personal care, which is uh, mostly um, Medicaid and, and other forms um, of uh, in-home support and care. Um, so this is a rough approximation of what we've seen across many, many studies uh, in the US, that um, minority cultures uh, have a strongly embedded sense of family uh, responsibility. Now, that's not always a good thing, mind you, so uh, I'll come back to that. Um, now, what's less studied, I think, is institutional capital. Um, and we can kind of think of this as the uh, welfare state supporting older people. Uh, in some ways, uh, we can think of the welfare state provisions to older people in the most evolved of these uh, systems um, as um, rendering families somewhat less important. But I think that's probably too um, simple. Um, to, to claim, and I'll show you some exceptions. Um, I'm going to wrap all of this in uh, Pierre Bourdieu's um, notion of capital with uh, maybe some apologies for tweaking it to fit the uh, intergenerational dynamics that I'm talking about. Um, but I think it works well. Um, cultural capital, I talked about, um, but it's implicit knowledge about what's expected. Uh, social capital, um, it's resources that um, are gotten through relationships, networks of influence and investment. So all these terms, I think, come up in the intergenerational um, dynamics I'm referring to. Uh, and then institutional capital is political, the political economy that institutionalizes the allocation of resources. And I think it's important here to realize that um, these resources can complement family support, that is, um, uh, exist in parallel to it or in combination with it, or it could counter cultural capital or family support. That is, they could work opposing it in a zero-sum game where the state provides more, the families will provide less. Um, to look at um, family support across a wide variety of nations, you have to summarize nation states in some fashion, and the most widely used one is the Esking Anderson model. And so here we have three breakdowns. There are more than this, uh, but these are the basic ones. Social democratic welfare states, which is characteristic more of Scandinavian countries, uh, usually a single universal insurance system in place. And this is certainly true for old age care and support. Uh, the liberal welfare states, um, the US, UK, and Germany are put in this group where assistance is more limited. It's a modest social insurance program. Um, and um, it's often means tested, that is, you only get it if you qualify under certain conditions. Uh, the conservative welfare states, um, the state holds back until absolutely necessary. Families are expected uh, to be the primary providers of first, of first uh, resort. Um, so I'm going to maintain here that um, we, when, when, when we talk about values and norms, um, 
it's very easy to gravitate toward um, the, the notion that these are embedded within uh, cultural groups, like Hispanic Americans or Asian Americans or, or Chinese. And I would say that uh, values are just as valid to talk about within a nation state. And this probably comes from spending um, many months um, in Scandinavia and seeing it from the outside and seeing the values within, held within Scandinavia about how important the welfare state is for the welfare of the population and for the welfare of themselves and for the welfare of their parents made me think that this is a, a very strong underlying value um, that's implicit within government programs. So I'm going to talk about the welfare state as a moral agent, um, policies of which may free or obligate um, adult children to provide uh, support for their parents. Um, this is um, also, you'll see this uh, referred to as the crowding out and crowding in debate, whether formal care, state-provided care crowds out family care, substitutes for family care, or whether formal care might even crowd in family care that is work in tandem with families to allow them to do a better job. Uh, evidence that I'll show you in a minute shows that um, uh, home help provisions crowd in less intensive forms of family care, more casual kind of care. Um, uh, so when parents are getting more from the state, then families will uh, provide um, more casual, more intermittent um, forms of care, uh, but crowd, crowds out more intensive forms of care, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, some of this work has been done in terms of attitudes, and this is, um, sorry, I don't have the citation here. This is uh, Dotland and his colleagues in Norway who did a five-country study, and I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that the fifth country is the UK, and I forgot, <laughs> forgot to put it in here, uh, but it'll come up in the next slide. Uh, this is about um, uh, preferences for public versus family care. And, of course, you can say you want both, um, this is a simplification to uh, look at the primary, um, who, who should be primarily responsible for care of the elderly. And you can see 90% in Norway of this national sample said public services. Um, um, in Israel, it's 77.5%. But you can see, um, as you might expect, um, in Spain, uh, you see a pretty even distribution between public services and family. So, uh, and this, I think, Given later data, we know this is true across a lot of um, uh, other Mediterranean countries where family values are strong and there's more um, resistance to the public sector. Uh, in terms of care received, this is from Dotland and Lowenstein, 2005. This is uh, a survey of the 75 and older population with some um, uh, uh, disability. Um, and you can see here there are combinations possible. So you can get only family care, family and welfare care, welfare state care, only welfare state care, and other kind of care. And here you can see if you um, look at the um, uh, uh, family welfare state or only welfare state, Norway comes out quite uh, on top in the light blue and, and the white bars. Um, uh, and um, uh, Spain uh, seems to dominate again with only family care and relatively little welfare state um, intervention. So um, this north-south divide, which people talk about, as well as this east-west divide, seems to hold true both in terms of attitudes and in terms of supportive behavior. Oh, that's me, I'm sorry. I never get a call on my English phone, so I don't know why it's <laughs> I'll just let it ring. Um, this is um, work done by uh, Brandt and colleagues. Uh, showing uh, a, a wider swath of countries. And here you can see on the left, uh, this is um, uh, care for parents. This is intensive forms of caregiving um, across different um, state regimes. And you can see the darker colors um, of um, uh, Spain, um, Italy um, are, um, are dominant here. And so, um, uh, you could say, you come away from this, although it's not what we might call a causal analysis, that in uh, countries where welfare state is relatively weak, families are more involved with caregiving. But if you flip this around to look about help, and help is running errands, so not intensive things, not daily care, but intermittent things that you might do for your parents, as well as visiting them, 
uh, we see that that's actually stronger in the Scandinavian countries. And so this they take as evidence of crowding in, that when you know your parents are going to be taking, that when the heavy duty work is taken care of by the state, that opens up a door for you to have closer, more meaningful relationships with your parents. So that's a broad conclusion from this relatively simple uh, model. And you know, this is um, the results of a multivariate model with a lot of control variables, but still, um, these are very difficult things to test in terms of uh, national care regimes. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, and I'm gonna just suggest in the last few minutes, um, in trying to reconcile this idea of personal, call it personal capital, that's a result of your immediate family and maybe your cultural group and the welfare state, which also is a form of capital, but and also has underlying values attached to it. I'm coming up with the notion that moral capital might be a way to kind of link these two ideas, that they link uh, into a common currency um, the um, uh, values for elder care that may be manifest differently across countries. That is, countries may have equal commitment to elder care, but uh, allocated differently across family and state um, actors. Of course, um, consequences could be very different uh, across the different ways of balancing this. So the balance toward family care that we see in Spain, in Italy, um, in China, um, puts a lot of responsibility on caregivers and may produce a lot of caregiver burden may keep women out of the labor force. So there are unintended residual consequences of that. But a balance towards strong institutional or strong government care might create inefficiencies, that is, crowd out what families might uh, want to and can do um, uh, outside of the government, um, or lead to more impersonal care that um, has often been accused of state-provided state -provided, um, assistance. So I'm not going to talk a lot about these unintended consequences, but um, obviously they're there and need to be considered in any sort of policy development. Um, so I want to sum up, because I think about 45 minutes, um, just to go back to the beginning, it does seem to us over a variety of studies that micro exchange dynamics are very important um, in understanding um, kinship um, uh, kinship support, especially support from adult children that play out over many decades. Uh, culture um, is also a prominent factor, and we see um, great differences across cultural groups, at least in the United States, and uh, as well as in Europe. Um, the cultural norms and the reciprocity that exists within families um, justifies duties um, to children, um, but uh, to some degree are calibrated by what exists in the larger um, institutional environment here, the welfare state. Um, so relative to what's provided by the state, families will adapt to um, what they need to do. And here I would say national regimes operate under um, an ideology of a, of a certain culture of care um, that um, frees or obligates uh, family uh, support. Um, in some sense, family and state support are complementary to each other. The whole idea of crowding out seems to um, exist with heavy duty, medicalized kinds of care that makes sense where you need uh, professionals and technicians to uh, uh, do a lot of the care. Uh, but where care is a matter of hard labor, uh, families um, can um, uh, help uh, as well. So the question is, do we get the welfare state that we deserve that's consistent with our national norms? Um, I'll leave that um, mostly as, a, as an open question, but um, after seeing how it works in Scandinavia, um, it's consistent with their strong values of egalitarianism um, and universalism, um, and it would be abhorrent for them to change it, at least radically, although I think tweaks are going to need to be made. So in conclusion, I'm going to just throw out some policy um, points here. Um, and that programs that serve informal caregivers, serve the caregivers themselves, such as respite care, home health services, cash payments, um, can allow family members to uh, carry out their duties um, as long as possible. So if families uh, uh, feel um, compelled to care for their own, whether that's due to cultural reasons, personal reasons, whether they have economic resources to do so, um, why not um, provide those services that enhance uh, family care, so enable the cultural resources to, to be uh, fulfilled. 
Um, and in this sense, I think formal services can work with familistic tendencies um, if they're strategically um, allocated by lifting some of the heavy burdens off, off of informal caregivers uh, in, in countries where um, those state resources are, are more uh, modest. But as societies move uh, in the aging of their populations, and every society seems to be shifting in that direction, some faster than others, um, this idea of moral capital um, may result in some interesting shifts. And here I'm speculating about uh, something called Scandinavian filial piety. Right? So it seems like a contradiction. Um, but the tremendous tax rate investment in care for older people in Sweden is no less a, a value and, a, and, a, and, a, and an institutional commitment uh, to older people that um, I think can be called filial uh, piety in some sense. If you talk to people about what the state should do for vulnerable uh, members, people will support that. And then in places like China, we can think about the Confucian welfare state. Uh, what we're seeing in China for the older population in just the last 10 years, the emergence of universal pensions, uh, the emergence of universal health care uh, for older people, um, just the first start of long-term care um, provision um, for older people is coming online. I think in another 10 years, we're going to see um, a lot of investment in that area as well. Uh, will it have a Chinese face? Yes. Will it be consistent with filial piety? I think it has to. So we're going to see these hybrid models as Sweden maybe moves a little bit more toward privatization. Um, they will have put more responsibility on the family. In China, I think it'll go the other way in terms of more um, uh, moral capital invested um, in, uh, in the government and government support, especially with the sharp reduction in family size that has occurred over the last 30 years. So um, these are mostly speculations, and um, the future is hard to predict, as we know, but um, there it is, and I, I thank you for listening. LSOG, and given that most of the caregivers um, in your study um, are middle-aged women, I'm wondering, in terms of exchange motive, if you found any gender differences between um, modeling, support bank, and, um, and bequests? Um, we did look at, um, you might call it interactions between gender and um, of, the, of the caregiver or, or the child. and. Um, these mechanisms, and um, there's just not enough power statistically to detect it. So I could say no, but it could be in a bigger sample we would be able to see it. But I think that's an interesting question. I mean, limiting it to, we thought about limiting it just to daughters, to make it simple. Um, but again, we shrink the sample. So um, would you expect one to do differently than the other? Um, I'm not sure uh, in the US. Uh, in China, maybe it works differently, because. Uh, you would have son preferences, and investment in sons might be more important. Uh, in the U.S., might be investing in daughters is more important. But um, you know, that's but it's an interesting direction, I think. But I, I can tell you that it doesn't doesn't make a difference statistically. Um, is there any evidence that education, um, investing in children's education, will be a benefit for aging parents? Do higher educated children care better for the aging parents? Well, higher educated children, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, one thing I didn't talk about was um, paying for care, right? So the children could actually pay for care. And um, we have a measure of that, but it didn't happen often enough. Um, higher educated children would be better off financially and might uh, delegate that um, work to an outside source by payment. And so that's you know within our theoretical model, but couldn't be tested in the empirical model. But I can tell you that education being controlled, um, we see less care for the more educated. And that's probably because um, we don't have occupation controlled, and I think there'd be more work interference, um, work for pay interference with the caregiving. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I was interested in the, in the 
in the long longitudinal aspect of, of, of your study. And I was wondering whether um, you depicted, you, you showed us the graph which showed the main elements of your model. And I'm interested in the right-hand side of the model. You had uh, talked about two different types uh, of, of help, instrumental support and social-emotional support. I was curious whether you had observed in, in the data any shift from the preference in, um, for support from the older people themselves, whether they would perhaps um, expect more social-emotional support from the children mm -hmm. and less instrumental support. Uh, I worked with older Japanese um, for a long time, and the, the cultural expectation is that uh, Japanese themselves would prefer um, to live with their oldest son, for instance, and be taken care in the family. In fact, older people themselves really did not necessarily want this type of care. Mm -hmm. So I was curious whether you were able to show something. Yeah, that's a good point. We don't, we don't, uh, we have measures of expectation. Um, and I guess that's um, embedded in uh, what's called filial norms here. That is, it, it's a more generic question, not a particular, about particular children. So is, should children provide X, Y, and Z to their parents? So it's a, sometimes that's a better measure because it's not dealing with the uh, uh, individual uh, people who we were talking about, but a more general ex expectation of what the role of children should be. And um, so that's, that's, of course, positively related to uh, both of these things. Parents who expect more from children usually get more from children. This could be a um, chicken and egg <laughs> issue. We don't know which comes first. But it's interesting you should mention Japan because they've done some work in Japan showing that uh, depression levels are higher when Japanese uh, elders um, live with their children but prefer not to, right? So it could be some kind of cross-cutting you know, issues here if we extend this to some other uh, kind of outcome which would be related to well-being, you know? So, um, and we have done some work in that area. And clearly, people who get over-support um, feel infantilized, and, and that's related to negative emotional outcomes. This is work I did 20 years ago. So it's, it's an important aspect of this, um, and something we could incorporate. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, I have a question about moral capital, um, which you said may be constant over time. Um, and I'd like you to say a little bit more about that, really, because um, I'm not quite sure whether you're saying it is, or you're assuming that it is, or you, you just don't really know whether it is or not. Um, if it's the latter, do you think it's something that you could look at over time to say, oh, there's now more of it than there was 20 years ago, or mm -hmm. less of it than there was 20 years ago? The moral capital, the yeah. Moral. yeah, yeah, the moral capital part. Yeah, we've, um, again, going back to the norms in this model, we've, uh, we have some papers, um, mostly theoretical with some very uh, descriptive um, empirical part to think about these filial norms as a as a as an embedded moral capital and we then try to track it over time and um, we did a paper decomposing historical cohort and individual development in norms like do people feel that children should support their parents overall this is different from the state but it's the best we have to see whether um, that holds over the life course and in fact um, it actually goes up with aging, and it also goes up with historical time. So there is, seems to be a hyper sense of responsibility that people feel that children should have for their parents, uh, both as they're getting older, which you might expect, but we were surprised also to see it over historical time. So the more modern um, cohort here, um, the, um, the children, uh, these are middle-aged parents and their, uh, middle-aged children and their parents, but the children of those baby boomers are actually expressing stronger norms of filial support. So if you take that as moral capital, um, people seem to really feel like they need to help the elderly. And that's a stronger position than it was in the past. It's a little bit of a surprise, but. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, we have seen that there are certain mechanism how certain factors contribute to a successful uh, social contract or sort of um, capital flow. But have you noticed in your research what sort of factors contribute to the uh, either failed reciprocal process mm -hmm. or broken contract? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Yeah, we. Um, that's a good question because we have obviously those people in the in the study uh, that we can uh, get at um, in some way through. Uh, 
more of a case analysis, right? Because um, uh, to go more in depth about what happens with those families, um, where the contract seems to be uh, broken, I think, and this isn't my work, but other people who've done work in this area, uh, there are negative outcomes, negative health, negative emotional outcomes when uh, there's a, uh, a, a break in the tie um, with, with children. Um, it's very distressing to parents. Um, not only interferes with support, but I think um, you know it's, it's problematic in a lot of ways. We do see this in terms of um, alcohol abuse. So um, we see children who had um, parents in 1985 who consumed lots of um, alcohol. Uh, we turn the clock ahead. We see those ties tend to be much weaker emotionally, much um, more, uh, much less frequent contact. Uh, whether they're broken totally or not, you know, it, it, we, we didn't go into that kind of detail. Um, but those seem to have negative effects on the parent, even above and beyond the alcohol abuse itself. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Beryl, again, for giving us a very stimulating overview. And I know there are lots more questions. And um, we really are um, working Professor Silverstein whilst he is here, because tomorrow um, at 2.30, Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Yeah, two o'clock. Yeah. Um, at the Institute of Population Aging, which is 66 Banbury Road, uh, Merrill will be giving um, a research seminar uh, looking at his work on Chinese families. Chinese elders, yep. yep. And families. So, so, can we thank him very much for a very interesting Thank you. Talk.